Okay, good. Well, I, I'm very glad to be back uh, in the French Alps. Uh, 25 years ago, I was a resident of uh, Chambéry, and uh, it was a very pleasant time in my life. And so I, I, I realize I have to have put the microphone very close to my mouth. So I'm very glad to be here to be invited to give this presentation today. Um, I should say that I, I do like Jean, I speak French, but not quite at the level that I would like to, to give this presentation. Uh, and I think in English, so it is better that I speak in English too. But again, with the questions, I'm, I'm, as long as they are slow, not too quick, I will be happy if they are in French. Um, so, uh, my presentation today I think actually, yes, Jean and I, we met in the restaurant last night by chance, um, and I think, I hope we are quite complimentary, and some of the points I will make actually link very nicely to things that he said. Um, whether that is chance or good planning, who knows. But uh, anyway, my presentation today is about specifically Europe's mountains, what we know about them, the characterization, and a little bit at the end about the policies and the actors involved in uh, making those policies and implementing those policies. The presentation is based on five studies that I have been involved in uh, for the last, uh, well, quite a long time. And this is to show not just where this information is coming from, but also that the interest in mountains at the European level has been uh, in very many different venues. Um, you can see here um, not only Euromontana, uh, an organization responsible, interested uh, for mountain interests, but also one directorate general of the European Commission, the European Environment Agency, ESPON, and the European Parliament. So what it shows is that over these um, uh, 16 years, there has been an interest in many different parts of the European uh, architecture of institutions about mountains. Sometimes it comes and goes, sometimes it continues, but there has been a, a, a continuing and repeated interest, uh, and I will come back to that uh, very much at the end of this presentation. So first to go to the characterization, which is the main part of this presentation. One of the questions that John had was, where, where are mountains? What are mountains? And at the national political level, we have had definitions in different countries, as you will see, all Alpine countries, since the 1930s. And you can see that these definitions of where, where are mountains in specific countries very much were to do with agriculture, supporting mountain <coughs> agriculture, supporting mountain people in different countries. I won't go into all the detail here, there's plenty to talk about. So at the national level there was a rec recognition of the importance of, of mountains for, for many, many decades. In the European Union, 1975 was a critical year in which there was a directive on mountain and hill farming in less favored areas. Um, and this <coughs> remains the only specific, well actually no, there are now two directives on mountains in, from the EU. You will see from the graph in the middle that what is a mountain was defined principally in terms of elevation, although I will come back to that in a moment. And of course, your minimum elevation for a mountain <coughs> increases as you go further south, effectively, is what's shown on this graph. And this is different. Each country could apply this directive to its own mountains as that country defined them. Very peculiarly, in 1999, after the accession of Finland and Sweden to the European Union, um, it was agreed that because those countries don't have so many mountains, but they have similar constraints to agriculture, that all areas north of 62 degrees north, whether they were mountainous or flat, would be re recognized as mountains from a policy point of view, which is a rather strange concept, but at least it is still there. And then in 2003, we have a new uh, directive 
recognizing the development of mountain foods, quality products from mountain areas as a specific mechanism for bringing uh, value to uh, what mountain people are producing. So now to come back, this is the first link to what Jean uh, was talking about. This is the map of mountains uh, from 2000, uh, from Valerie Kafos and others. Uh, this was a project I was responsible for. And we used a variety of different criteria to define where mountains are on the Earth's surface. Altitude, elevation, uh, sorry, slope, and then topographic roughness or I don't know how you pr translate this from into French, what I call lumpiness. Um, but it is the, the, the relief of, of areas. And this was possible because uh, in the late 1990s we had a global uh, digital elevation model that gave us the average elevation of every square kilometer of the Earth's land surface. And so we could use this uh, to test different combinations of altitude, slope, and this roughness of terrain to come up with definitions of mountains. This sounds very scientific and objective, but of course, to define your criteria is subjective. So we ended up with, this, uh, with a map of the world's mountains, uh, and we said that 24% of the Earth's land surface was mountainous, which I have to say was a higher percentage than had been generally thought of before. Um, the criteria, came from scientists, but they also came from mountaineers and from policymakers. So it was a very interesting uh, political process as well as a scientific one. Using a version of that, we then uh, defined that 35% of Europe is mountainous. Uh, that was first in 2004. I'm using the same map uh, from, from 2010, we have used the same one continually. Um, those of you from Switzerland will recognize that parts of your country you probably wouldn't recognize as mountainous are viewed as mountainous. Equally, parts of Norway that most of us would see as mountainous are not seen as mountainous because they are too flat at high altitude. So this is the problem with applying consistent criteria over very large areas. Uh, the local uh, characteristics, the local issues are not always recognized when you do things at a, a global or a European, a very large scale area. But you have to start from somewhere. And a lot of the rest of my presentation is based on this map uh, and, and the, the, the uh, analyses that can be made used on using these spatial data. Those mountains. Just some pictures to remind you something of mountains in Europe. Mountains are very diverse in Europe as they are worldwide. So just going from, from north to south to remind you some photographs that I happen to have in my collection from Norway, from where close to where I live in Scotland, from the Pyrenees, from the Alps, from the Carpathians, from Turkey. They are all quite different in many ways, but they are all high, steep, and rough terrain. And finally, <coughs> yes, there are islands that have mountains too in Europe. <coughs> now, once we know we can define where are the mountains, then we can overlay that with other sorts of databases to which show where is the population, and we end up again with this result then that 17% of Europe's population lives in mountain areas, which is quite a significant proportion. From a political point of view, to argue that one-sixth of the European population lives in mountain areas <coughs> is quite good for your arguments. However, if you look at the statistics on the bottom right-hand side, you can see that a large proportion of those people are living in Turkey, so outside the EU. Um, the next largest are in the Balkans or Southeast Europe, and then come the Alps and the other ranges after that. The colors uh, in, on, on the map show the number of people per country, not per, per massif. So you can see the countries with the largest number are Turkey and Italy, and then uh, we go down 
for instance, in, into Southeast Europe in, the, in Bulgaria uh, and Romania and so on. Now, those proportions change over time. Uh, I'm not going to be very historical uh, in this presentation. This is on a very few uh, slides that really is showing changes in population. But there have been quite significant changes in the proportion on, in the number of people living in those mountain areas over time. And if we use 1961 as a starting point, and if I was Jean, I would go a lot further back, and the lines would be much more up and down, I suspect, in many areas. But you can see since 1961, there have been significant decreases in the population of the mountains of the British Isles, in the Apennines, and in the Carpathians. Uh, and then the grey line that you can see dropping very substantially from 2001 is the mountains of southeastern Europe. In most other areas, the populations have been increasing over the last 50 years or so. But it is always nice to be able to give general trends like this. But the realities, and this is a theme I will come back to very often in this presentation, the realities, if you start zooming in to smaller areas, are highly diverse and very variable. So, for instance, you can see, if we look at uh, Spain, for instance, uh, very big increases in some places, but very big decreases in other places. And uh, this, this is true any, any part of Europe that you go to. There are places, neighboring communes, which are increasing and others that are decreasing. And this is data at the level of the commune of the 130,000 uh, communes in Europe. And this has been one of the main themes of the projects that we have done over the last few years, is that many policies are made at the basis, the regional basis. The problem is that if most regions include areas of decrease and areas of increase, so what of the, which, which criteria do you look at? Do you look at the, the regional level, which may be going one way, or are we concerned with the small changes in other places at very different scales? This is a big challenge uh, for making policies. If we look, however, at some of the uh, characteristics in the population, uh, we can see that there are some things that are more typical of mountains than perhaps of other parts of Europe. In terms of young people, there is a great diversity in the, the, the changes uh, over time um, and, and also comparing to the national average. Young people, there are some areas with young, many young people, there are some areas with a relatively small number. But if you look at the proportion <coughs> over 60, you can see that for a very large proportion of Europe's mountains, you have a higher than average uh, to, of the national proportion, uh, except you can see in parts of, uh, of the west of the Eastern Alps and to some extent of the Western Alps. But in very large parts of the European mountains, we have a real challenge of an overaged population, uh, and that of course has significant uh, ramifications uh, for, for services uh, and for many, many <coughs> other issues that we are concerned with. One of the things that is connected to that is how close is a particular mountain area to large urban areas. And this looks at the accessibility of mountain areas uh, to cities of at least 100,000 people. And what we can see is that around the edges of the large mountain massifs, uh, we still have a lot of accessibility, not only for people to commute in, but for people to go uh, at the weekend out to the mountains for recreation and tourism. But, of course, in the centre of the Alps, for instance, or in the middle of the Apennines, uh, or around the Balkans, we have very fewer cities. 
far fewer cities. And that has a real influence on the demographic trends. So that in the areas near the cities, we very often have increases of population, whereas the areas away from the cities, the rural areas, that is where the population tends to decrease. But remember the previous map which showed the very great variety at the communal level. And we can see, again, generalizing uh, in the Pyrenees, if you look at the top, a big change, a big difference between the communes that are close to the urban areas versus the ones that are close to, uh, that are not close to them. And especially down in the Balkans and the south east of Europe, you can see a big difference between areas close to the cities where generally there has been an increase over this last decade versus the areas where there has been a decrease, which are the rural areas far from the mountains. Another question one might ask is, what is the economic density? What are the incomes of mountain people? Are they different from people in other parts of Europe? And here I've shown both the map for the whole of Europe, and then I've cut out just the mountains on the right-hand side. What you can see then is, on the left-hand side, there is a huge diversity of <coughs> income across the mountain, uh, across all the communities of Europe, all the communes of Europe. But if you look at the mountains, are they maybe poorer than the rest? It's very difficult to say. Statistically, the answer is no, they are not. But of course, if you tend to be closer to an urban area, the income tends to be higher, and if you are tend to be close, if you are far from an urban area, it tends to be lower. Statistically, however, it doesn't, it is not, there is no stati statistical significance to this. So this is an interesting map, but probably a not particularly useful one. Again, another question is, well, what sort of jobs do people have in mountain areas? And you can look at this again at the regional scale, and you can see quite large variations, um, for instance, in the mountains of, of Scandinavia, in, in Norway and Sweden, you can see the majority of jobs are in the tertiary sector. Uh, that's principally government, but also tourism. And in Turkey, the majority of jobs are in the rural sector, the, the, the primary sector. But also, for instance, if you look at the Carpathians. But again, if you go to a more refined analysis, you get very complex, complex results. The Carpathians, yes, the majority are uh, in agriculture, but many others have something else going on, especially once you get up to the, uh, the Carpathians of Slovakia. So in Romania, very much agriculture. In Slovakia, uh, quite a lot in many different other occupations. And in the Alps, it is so complicated, again, it is very hard to draw any uh, conclusions, although there have been projects such as Diamant which have uh, looked into this in much more detail. So, moving on then from the people in the mountains, how many there are, their ages, uh, the numbers and the trends, we look a little bit about the land use of the mountains. And of course, land use in mountains <coughs> is not just driven by what's going on in the mountains, but by what's going on elsewhere. And uh, I just have chosen a few pictures uh, to remind us of some of those drivers. On the top left, this is what we in Britain are meant to eat to be healthy. Um, and not all of that necessarily is coming from the mountains. We are encouraged to eat more vegetables and fruits, which very often are not coming from the mountains. Meat may be coming from the mountains, and that will be coming, for instance, from this uh, man herding his sheep in the, in the highlands of, of Britain. And if we look at forestry, again, there are many different drivers of land use in, in mountain areas. I put the picture on the top left in here because this is the tallest completely wooden building 
in the world. It's an 18-story, completely wooden building up in northern Norway. Um, and if we build more with wood, we will be able to uh, use more wood, we will be able to uh, keep it as wood rather than burning it or letting it decay. Um, but at the same time, uh, mountain forests are critical as habitat, if you look at the left-hand side, and particularly as places uh, for recreation and tourism. The productivity of mountain forests is many times nowadays less of a driving force than the other uh, functions of those forests. And also to say more, more and more in a, a period when we are concerned with climate change, the fact that of course trees are mainly made of carbon is, is something that is driving many decisions about forest land uses in, in mountains. In my own country, for instance, we have a, a, we have a policy to try and plant more forests. They tend to be in the mountains uh, to store more carbon. But if we look at the land cover types across Europe's mountains, we find that um, there is more forest than anything else. 41% of those mountains are, are covered with forest. Um, in the northern parts of Europe, the other type is grassland, uh, which is the bright green. In the south of Europe, we see more arable land. Um, and so we have quite different pictures in the proportions of the other types of land, uh, of land uses in the European mountains. But forests are very important as, as part of the land cover. Uh, and over the last decades, the amount of forests has been increasing. Creation is perhaps not the right, right word in all cases. So just again to give a few pictures of uh, mountain land covers in different parts of Europe, in, in Norway, um, forests are, there have always been forests, but they are certainly increasing. In the highlands, we have much stranger looking forests because they have been planted in response to uh, government policies over long periods. In the Carpathians, as I will come back to, they are increasing. In the Alps, they have very much been increasing as agriculture uh, has pulled away from the higher and the steeper places uh, and places and farther from settlements. And so we have an, a relationship then between <coughs> farm abandonment and forestry. And I put those two uh, red circles on this map just to give an example. In Austria, if you look at the one on the right, uh, there is a real policy to keep people in the mountains. And it's very striking to see this difference between the amount of abandonment on the Italian side versus the abandonment on the Austrian side. You can really see the influence of a policy uh, markedly having an influence on the uh, abandonment of the land here and to a certain extent also on the border between, um, between Italy and Switzerland, although it's maybe not quite as marked. But again, this relates to policy, and there is a link here between abandonment and part-time farming. Again, the policy in Austria is to uh, have as much part, a, a lot of part-time farming. It's really supported by national policies, less so in Italy. So again, you can really see this difference uh, between, uh, on the left-hand side, between Switzerland and Italy, and on the right-hand side, between Austria and Italy. So we have interacting forces that are driving land uses um, from, from different sources. And if we look also at a few other changes in the landscape, um, these are, are pictures from, from different websites. Um, looking over uh, longer periods, uh, that there is climate change, yes, but there are many other factors driven by economics and policies. For instance, from pastures to apple orchards in the South Tyrol of Italy. In Verbier, tourism coming in and completely covering an area that used to be summer pasture. And so those are two examples uh, of changes in land use. Um, and it is a very dynamic process all over Europe. Another 
a reason why mountains are important all around the world, but uh, particularly, well, in Europe as in many other places, is that they are the, the water towers uh, of, of, of the world. And this small diagram gives an example of the, uh, the relationship between precipitation and evaporation and runoff in the Alps versus the, the other parts of Europe. And you can really see, as we know, the, the, the clouds rise, the rain and the snow fall in the Alps, and then it comes downstream uh, in the spring and, and throughout the year. So really, the amount of water coming from the mountains uh, is a critical <coughs> issue for the whole of Europe. Um, it is important as sources of water. It is also important because that water can be used for hydroelectricity, as here uh, from the Swiss Alps. That has many different impacts, uh, which partly relate to the, uh, the amount developed for hydropower and the um, proportion of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, potential that has been developed varies quite differently in different parts of Europe. In the Alps, we have almost all uh, rivers have been dammed for hydroelectricity and other things. <coughs> in other parts of Europe, there is much less. Um, so this is another difference of dif of across different parts of Europe. And now, again, with the decrease in nuclear energy, uh, the increase in interest in renewables, there is more and more demand for hydro, small hydro, and also large hydroelectricity right throughout all of the mountains of Europe and not just in the Alps. <coughs> but we also can see over the last uh, few decades that there seem to have been increases in flooding and the amount of impacts of these floods. Um, this chart only goes up to, to 10 years ago. It's the best one I can find. Um, the point is, though, that most of these major impacts, economic impacts, are coming from relatively from single events. They are not generalized. They are coming from very uh, specific events. And of course, this is a real concern uh, in my own country and, and in many other uh, mountain areas across Europe, but also globally, uh, that with climate change, we will have more extreme events. So the likelihood of these sorts of costs, economic costs, but also human costs going up, are, are likely to increase in the future. And it's not just about the extreme events, but the overall availability of water. Here I'm not saying anything particularly about the mountains, but from north to south, it is likely uh, we will have much drier conditions further south, much wetter further north. So if you're in Norway and you want to generate hydroelectricity, the future is looking quite good. If you're in Spain or Italy and you want to generate hydroelectricity, the future is probably not going to be so good. So this linkage between the mountains and the lowlands and the, the use of mountain water, not just for itself, but for producing energy, is something that is really a changing uh, issue that we are going to have to consider for the next few uh, years. Another issue, another point where mountains are definitely special at the European level and also at the global level, is that they are hotspots of biodiversity. Um, this is a map which is actually quite old, but there isn't a better one. Um, and it shows in red the places where there are uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of species, plants, birds, and mammals. Blue are ones where there are a lot of species that are endemic, ones that are restricted to relatively small areas. And in the middle, the green ones are both. And if you know your geography of Europe, you can see that nearly all of these spots are on the mountains. Why is that? Because they are very diverse habitats uh, with lots of different elevation slopes and roughness. So it is not surprising, but there are also other reasons. So we can see uh, fantastic flower meadows in mountains uh, all, all around Europe. We can see animals that are, are only living in mountain areas, such as chamois. <coughs> 
and birds also. But we can also find other species that are not only interesting from a biological and maybe a tourism point of view, but from an eating point of view and maybe a health point of view. And in fact, uh, mushrooms in some forests, if you look at the cumulative value of the mushrooms over uh, the 100 year period of a forest producing, the cumulative value of the mushrooms is actually greater than the cumulative value of the wood in those forests. This is something I learned about from Italy, but I think is true in many other parts of the world. And in fact, uh, there has been other work done in the Pyrenees. Ma mushrooms are actually a huge multi-billion dollar industry in Europe and globally. And there is a huge potential for, for this uh, around the world, um, which is gradually being recognized in, in many parts of the world. Um, I'm not showing a picture here in, in in other parts of the world, uh, herbs and other plant species are also very important economically and for people's health. Uh, and that's also true to a certain extent here in Europe, although maybe not monetized as much as, as the mushrooms. But if we look at the future in terms of biodiversity, um, we can see that there are going to be some significant impacts of climate change. Um, as the temperatures warm up, species are going to be able to move upwards on mountains if there is enough space for them, because that is a real challenge for the future. And equally, we will find species moving further north if it is possible for them to do so. Butterflies, insects, movable uh, species are able to move north. Plant species, of course, unless they are carried by the wind, this is much more difficult for them. What we are finding also is that tree lines are moving upwards. Um, this is particularly marked already in Scandinavia. Um, but it is also uh, a factor of, of land use change, as I, was, I will come to in a moment. Um, we're finding longer growing seasons so that plants can grow longer, although there are challenges for many of them because if they start to grow early in the spring and then there is a sudden frost, and this also affects Apple orchards, for instance, you have a challenge uh, that the, the, the buds can be killed by the, uh, by the frost. And so the phenology, the, the time of the year <coughs> when different uh, bud, buds are growing, uh, animals are breeding, etc., is changing uh, and, and moving earlier in the year. But this is a very, very complex set of issues because there are interactions not with just of climate change, but with land uses and climate change. So the movement upwards of forests is not just because it's getting warmer, but it's also because there is less grazing, for instance. <coughs> In terms of interactions between species, when you have plants that are the food sources for particular animals, and the animals are migrating, if the animals are coming at one time, but the plants are, are producing what they need, whether it is nectar or other sorts of fruits, for instance, at another time, and we dis unlink the, the, the processes over time, this is a challenge for, for those migrating species. And equally, the migrating species pollinate the plants, so this is also an interaction. So we are likely, in the next decades of the lifetimes of some of us, to look at new landscapes, that we will have quite different landscapes. Some species will become extinct. Um, and this is uh, very, it is very hard to predict how this will go at any level. And of course, the diversity of habitat species, um, different uh, climatic conditions that we have across Europe uh, make it even more difficult to predict the future. All we can predict is that the future will continue to be uncertain. And this relates to uh, another issue in, in many of mount mountain areas around Europe. Mountains are particularly include protected areas. But as I can, and I, as I've shown here, 15% of the area of the European mountains has been uh, designated for nature conservation. The problem with protected areas is that they have fixed boundaries. So if the landscapes are changing, if the plants and the animals are moving, 
are those protected areas going to be very useful anymore in the future? Um, I'm not going to get into discussions of connectivity conservation or conservation corridors or green infrastructure, which may well be the, uh, something that is talked about elsewhere in this conference. But protected areas may not be so useful as, as the whole, as the situation changes. Just again to give a few examples of, of these protected areas from, from Norway, from my own country, where uh, a national park is not just for protecting the environment, uh, but also for supporting uh, the, the local economy uh, and the local populations. From uh, Italy, I wanted to show this one because uh, another part of my work is about biosphere reserves, and this is a re relatively recent biosphere reserve, which is not just about protected areas, but about including the people around them in the management of the protected areas. And also, we do have some World Heritage Sites uh, in Europe, in the European mountains. But again, um, interestingly, the, the World Heritage Sites that we have in Europe are natural World Heritage Sites, although we have a very much cultural landscapes. So here in the Swiss Alps, the World Heritage Site includes the uninhabited parts of this part of the Swiss Alps. Whereas down slope from the mountains on all the way around, we have very active uh, cultural landscapes, which one could argue could also be uh, included in a World Heritage Site. I won't go again into the politics of why we have natural World Heritage Sites rather than cultural ones in, in Europe. I suspect it's about management. Uh, but uh, it, the point is that, strangely, in Europe, our World Heritage Sites tend to be natural World Heritage Sites rather than mixed ones or, or cultural ones. So, to conclude, I hope that gives you a good idea of the diversity, the complexity, the risks, the changes that we will be able to see, uh, or we might be able to see in the European mountains over the next few decades. Um, the, the main message is that making general statements is very risky, and making policies, as Jean also said earlier, is very difficult because of this diversity. So the last few minutes of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about a little bit about the policies that are specifically or partly relevant to the mountains and some of the actors uh, that are, are active uh, for European mountains. Again then, coming back to the national scale, we can see four different types of countries in terms of uh, policies to do with mountains. There are a number of countries in the first group uh, which have specific legislation for mountain areas. Um, France, Italy, Romania, Switzerland, Ukraine. Um, these are all countries with a significant proportion of their area within mountains. But there are other countries such as the next group, Austria, Germany and Spain. Austria and Spain especially have a large proportion in mountain areas which do not have specific legislation for mountain areas but tend to treat, they have multi-sectoral approaches uh, to, to their mountains. The majority of countries though in Europe, they tend to include mountains as one element of sectoral uh, policies and legislation in relation to agriculture, environment, rural development, forestry or tourism. And then there are some countries with no mountain policy or no policy relating to mountains. Obviously, uh, the Netherlands and Denmark uh, and Belgium, well, Belgium has some small mountains, but the Netherlands and uh, Denmark <coughs> have no mountain policy because they have no mountains. Um, but there are other countries where, because they are mainly mountainous, there is no special mountain policy because they don't see them as special. They, they say, well, our mountains are part of what our country is about, and therefore we don't have a specific policy for the mountains. So this relates to Greece, to Norway, and Slovenia. So different countries have 
considered mountains in different ways in their, in their national legislation. And there are also many regional approaches to uh, mountains across Europe. And this is not all of them. Uh, this was partly driven by what I could find on the internet the other day when I was looking for logos. But this gives the, the range of them. And at one level, we have the Alps, which, as many of you know, there is the Alpine Convention, which has been in force uh, since, since the year of Rio, 1991-92, um, and many other Europe Alpine institutions uh, to do with science, to do with many different other topics. So in the Alps, we have a series of overlapping uh, Alpine-specific institutions, and of course the Alpine Convention has many protocols uh, which relate to particular topics within the Alps. Similarly, a few years later, um, in the Carpathians, we have a Carpathian Convention involving uh, all the different Carpathian states. Interestingly, for a geographer, there is still not an agreement on the actual area that the Carpathian Convention relates to. There is a map for the Alpine Convention, but not for the Carpathian Convention. Um, and again, we have a framework convention and protocols on different topics uh, within the Carpathians. And then overlaying on those, we have many more institutions. We have working communities, which actually have been around even longer than those conventions in the Alps uh, and also in the Pyrenees. Uh, these are less formal, they are more for interaction and regional working together, regional collaboration. And then, even at smaller regions, at uh, smaller levels, we have Euro regions, which are, are the way of, of the European Union for developing, especially transnational between two or three states. And finally, the Conference France Jurassienne doesn't fit into all of these other ones, uh, but it's, it's another regional approach. The point, though, is that there are many collaborative approaches between governments, national governments, in the, in the case of the Alpine and the C Carpathian Convention, or regional governments in all the other cases, for working together, doing things together, uh, whether it's science, uh, regional development, or any other sorts of projects. Um, another one I could have included here for instance, is the Alpine Space Project of the EU. Uh, this is another example which goes outside the Alps. So there are many overlapping players here. Um, and I think one of the big challenges in terms of policy development and implementation in the Europe, in, in the European mountains, is there are so many overlaps. They can be positive uh, complementarities between these, but sometimes they work against each other. And I think this is a real challenge uh, in the future. This has been a, ch a challenge already. Then if we come to the European Union, the Lisbon Treaty refers to mountains as among other regions which, quote, suffer from severe and permanent natural or demographic handicaps. For people in the mountains and working uh, as, as we can say lobbyists on mountain topics, the word handicap is not always a very positive one. You don't want to be seen as handicapped. You often would rather be seen as a place that is special or has opportunities. However, this is the perception uh, and the formal uh, stated view of, of the European <coughs> Union. A key point, though, is as shown by this map, that these different regions are not isolated from each other. There are, the yellow ones are places that are just mountain, but the ones that are um, brown, the bottom of that star, are places that are mountain and island, which is another type of these uh, handicapped areas. In the north, we have the overlap between mountains and sparsely populated areas, and interestingly, there are also such areas in Spain and Turkey. Um, this is a, a, a map from a project that was done, uh, completed uh, a few years ago, uh, led by the University of Geneva, and this 
relates to this new project that Maria Lichnik uh, mentioned earlier on social innovation in marginalized rural areas. Um, we are still working on what are marginalized rural areas at the European scale, but part of the map will be very similar to this one uh, that, that I'm pre presenting at the moment. So again, when you, if, to make policies for mountain areas, you also need to take uh, care of other characteristics of those areas. If it is a mountain area that is also sparsely populated or also island, you may need to have other <coughs> angles to your policy. However, the, the European Union policies that focus on mountains uh, specifically or, or more generally are cohesion policy, which is uh, very much about leveling the playing field, one could say, across the mountains of Europe, uh, well, across all parts of Europe. Agriculture and rural development policies, biodiversity and nature conservation, for instance, the habitats and birds directive, again, because such a large proportion of the mountains are important for their biodiversity, but also all these other ones that I'm mentioning here in forestry, water, climate change, environmental impact assessment, and sustainable development, all mention mountains to a certain extent, but they are not major lines within those policies. And then we have a number of actors which are involved in developing and implementing those policies. And again, this is not a complete list because that again could be another lecture. Um, but the European Commission, of course, is a European actor which uh, has uh, a, a very strong interest in mountains from certain points of view. The European Parliament, uh, very recently has shown a strong interest in mountains. <coughs> and I think one of the reasons that this has happened is because of the recent expansion of the EU eastwards. It has brought a lot more mountain area into the European Union. And so what is interesting is that uh, in 2015 to 2016, uh, a, a member of the European Parliament from Bulgaria developed this own initiative report uh, which then led to a study which I mentioned earlier and to a resolution in the Parliament this year. Now resolutions of the European Parliament are not binding on anyone including the European Commission but they can be uh, an encouragement for, uh, for further action. Um, and uh, a, a good outcome of this, one might say, is that next year at least there will be a large conference on the mountains in the post-2020 agenda uh, held in Brussels in June, um, which will be organized by the uh, DG Regio, the, the Directorate General for, for Regional Development. A third group of, of actors then is, is the, the lobbying organizations, you could call them. Um, one of them is Euromontana, another is the Association des Élus de la Montagne, uh, which has a very strong base in France, as does Euromontana. Um, Euromontana <coughs> has existed for, uh, well, over 20 years. It celebrated its 20th anniversary last year. Um, one of its key successes uh, over many years is, to, is this delegated act on mountain products. So over a period of years, research was done uh, partly supported by the European Commission, which has shown the great value of mountain products uh, for mountain regions, uh, both for the people, but also for, for the environment. And this led to the Delegated Act uh, on, on mountain products. So there will be potentially labels uh, to make sure that if something is said to be from the mountains, it really is, which should add value and therefore help the economies. And Euromontana also every two years <coughs> organizes meetings of, of people interested in mountain areas, the European Mountain Conventions. So there are many actors uh, in, in the European mountains uh, which are involved in developing, implementing, and encouraging uh, policies. Finally then, I wanted to mention something that was, is directly relevant to, to this meeting, um, which is that scientists are also actors uh, in all of this. Obviously, most of what I presented in the first part of this presentation is the result of work by scientists, including myself. Um, 
but, but very many from many other different parts of Europe. And yet, mountains have not been the focus of strategic research in, at the European level up to now. Some countries, Switzerland for example, uh, have had specific national programs on mountain areas, Sweden and Norway also, for instance. But there has never been any uh, coordinated focus on European, uh, European focus on mountain issues. And for that reason, uh, over the last uh, couple of years, a group of scientists uh, led by the, the Mountain Research Initiative, but also the Austrian Academy of Sciences, and many other organizations, which you can see down here, and, and I think people in this room are, are from some of them. One of the, the uh, uh, so have been involved in, in putting together a strategic research agenda, which is trying to encourage a focus on mountains in the future work programs and calls of the Horizon 2020 program. Because I think there are real opportunities for a focus on mountains, not just because it's interesting, not just because it's valuable for mountain people, but because as this conference is arguing, many things that we can recognize as important and worthwhile in the mountains are relevant for the rest of Europe. And I think this is a key point always to think about, is that arguing that the mountains are important for themselves will never be successful if you are arguing to the majority of the European people who don't live in the mountains. But if you can argue that mountains are important for the majority of the population of Europe because they are places which provide their water, their energy, they are places they go to visit as tourists, and so on, then I think there is a better argument, and also, for instance, in the context of this conference, that they are places where really innovative things happen. So I'm going to finish this presentation <coughs> with a suggestion for you to do a little bit of homework in the next week. At the moment, there is a public stakeholder consultation on an interim evaluation of Horizon 2020. Um, that sounds rather heavy. The point is that this is an opportunity for all of you who are working in mountain areas and would like to encourage mountain areas to be uh, focused on more in the future calls of Horizon 2020, to tell the European <coughs> Commission this. So if you go to the website address at the top, which is uh, the website of the Mountain Research Initiative based in Switzerland, you will find a page about this. You will also find the strategic research agenda, which I just showed you. This is the front cover of it, which you could use as an attachment when you send in your, uh, your statement to this consultation. No one can guarantee, as I said, everything to do with the Europe mountains is uncertain. But at least if more of us are making the effort to send in responses to this consultation saying that it's important that Horizon 2020 gives a specific focus to mountain areas, uh, we may have an opportunity to make a difference. And of course, it might be quite useful for some of our professional careers as well in the future. Um, so. With that, uh, I will finish, uh, and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Sorry, do you want me to ask a question in English? If you're happy to speak in English, that's fine with me. <laughs> I can't say I'm really happy to do it, but I can. Uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm a bit surprised to... Uh, in your, in your presentation, you didn't speak about the macro-regional strategy for the Alps, uh, and I think it could be an interesting uh, topic to discuss with you, perhaps, especially because uh, it's strongly rooted on the, uh, well, the, the first motivations of the, uh, the macro-regional strategy is uh, to better link uh, metropoles and inner alpine regions and also to provide new approaches, multi-sectoral approaches, multi-level uh, governance approaches, 
Um, and I'm quite interested to have your point of view regarding this type of procedures. Yes, um, yes, you've noticed something I didn't put in, so thank you for uh, providing a lot of, of background. That is another level. I guess the, the, the point about the macro-regional strategy for the Alps is that it is the macro-regional strategy <coughs> for the Alps and the region around it. Uh, and I was focusing mainly on the mountains and not the regions around. But of course, you, you make the very good point that the whole point of those macro-regional strategies, and it is also being discussed for the Carpathians, for instance, that you cannot just cut a line and say, we are only interested in the mountains. We have to look at the connections uh, outside. Um, and I think this is a real challenge for, for the policy makers. Um, where do you draw the line between the mountains and the area around them? If you look at uh, where are most of the people living, they are living not in the mountains, they are living just around the outsides of the mountains. In fact, the population densities uh, around the mountains are some of the highest in Europe because traditionally they are places for exchange, uh, they are nice places to live, as, as you know here in Grenoble, one very good example. Um, so. The question is, if you are developing these regional strategies, is it really appropriate to call it the macro-regional strategy for, for the Alps? Well, actually, a very significant part of that macro-region is not what anyone would recognize as the Alps. It is the region affected by the Alps, and the same for the Carpathians. So, on a pragmatic point of view, this is a way to, to look forward uh, to get to, to recognize the importance of the interaction, for instance, between people who are living in the mountains and commuting outside the mountains on a daily basis. Um, at the same time, uh, it is perhaps a way to involve the politicians from outside the mountains on the flatter lands uh, with the politicians responsible inside the mountains to recognize they have a joint interest. Um, but sometimes the politicians inside the mountains and those of us who live inside the mountains may be a bit concerned that this is a dilution of the mountain mess. So I think it is, has a positive and a maybe not so positive aspect uh, of, of seeing what is mountain and what isn't mountain and what, where should we make policies for? What should we make policies for? Again, it links to the, the issue that um, if you look at the, uh, the statistics that many regional policies are based on, those statistics include, because of the, the areas, for instance, in this part of the world, Rhone Alp, or it is not even Rhone Alp anymore, it is not another. Uh, yes, Auvergne, Rhone Alp, yes. Uh, Auvergne, Rhone Alp, now is even more complicated because you have the Montagne d'Auvergne, and you have quite a lot of flat land, and you have the Alps. So. Uh, but this is a statistical area, and if you have a regional policy for such a statistical area, what is it actually going to focus on when it, that area has many different needs in different parts of it? So I think macro-regional policies, again, have their benefits, but sometimes they maybe are diluting things a bit too much as well. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, um... My question would be, um, you have um, very nicely uh, emphasized in, in your speech um, the importance of um, um, preserve conservation of biological diversity and uh, um, um, mountains being uh, centers of uh, ecological uh, heritage of Europe, speaking about uh, the European continent. Could you please tell um, uh, some more about cultural heritage and uh, mountains as centers of culture uh, in Europe and cultural diversity of uh, mountain uh, people, population? Thank you. Again, around the world we can point to mountain areas as being centers of cultural heritage as well as biological uh, what? cultural diversity as well as biological diversity and of course those two things often go very much together 
in, in many parts of the world and, and also in Europe. Um, it's, it's the reason I have, didn't say anything about that is that, as far as I know, there has never actually been a study on trying to compare, to give a, a European-wide analysis of cultural heritage, cultural diversity, at least not specifically in relation to mountains. And if, if I am wrong, then I will be very happy to hear about such a study. But at the same time, uh, in, in Europe, as in many parts of the world, we can look at uh, mountain <coughs> regions as places where uh, traditions have been held onto very particularly strongly, where you have uh, languages that re remain, like the Ladin, the Romanche, um, like some very strong dialects in Switzerland, for instance, um, so that there is a very strong cultural uh, heritage um, and, and that I think is, is still being maintained. Um, it is in the interests uh, very much of, of, European, of, the, of Europe to maintain that diversity. Um, <coughs> it is being given a value, I think, more and more in terms of, of heritage uh, and, and also in relation to tourism. Uh, and that her heritage also relates not just to the, the traditions of dress, uh, of uh, architecture, of settlement design, but also of food, of festivals, etc. Um, so I think that's true. That is a very bad generalization, and this is what I've been trying to say, is it is risky to generalize. But I think certainly in, in European mountains, they are still very much strongholds of cultural diversity, and I'm sure many people in this room are far more expert on that than I am. I have a question because before you also mentioned, I mean, following up also on uh, Maria's question, uh, the fact that many of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites are natural sites. And, you know, based on an experience in Italy, there was a site that was initially, um, not, you know, the nomination was for a cultural landscape, but this was not accepted and the UNESCO actually asked for the site to be reduced to exclude the cultural areas and to only you know focus on the mountains on the on the rocks and so i'm wondering also based on your position in the unesco um you know what kind of discussions are happening to this if if we're trying in some areas to highlight the cultural landscape aspects um why is you know <laughs> how, how, how can we achieve that and then you know this is in relation to areas that are maintained very natural in some ways um but then we have other areas that are very used, like vineyards, for example, that are accepted as, as cultural landscapes. So I wonder what, what you think about this. Yeah. Are, you, you. are you specifically talking about the Dolomites? Yes. Right, okay. <laughs> um, well, that, that's interesting because I didn't know that part of the history. I, I actually was the evaluator for the World Heritage Site of the Dolomites, which I have to say was one of the most the best weeks of my life. <laughs> um, and, and yes, you're right. I, and I now go back to the Dolomites because I recognize it is not just the very beautiful uh, geological history, but also the, the cultural landscape. In fact, I will be there in about six weeks times to go skiing. So um, I think though that maybe the, the question is, is that it is easier to make the argument based on the natural heritage uh, because you can show, specific, for instance, in the Dolomites, the, the reason for the World Heritage Site is that they have an incredible uh, geological history which is shown in one particular area. But it's interesting that part of the nomination document also talks about the, the aesthetics of the area. Um, but it is still uh, recognized as a, as a, as a natural World Heritage Site. The question, I suppose, it would be what is of universal value, because this is what a World Heritage Site, so what is really unique culturally about the Dolomites uh, that is different <coughs> from anywhere else? And I think you could also maybe make an argument about the Ladin culture of the Dolomites. Um, that could have been possible. Um, Another reason in the Dolomites also, though, was that they 
you have to exclude all the areas with very heavy tourism developments, which is a problem in the Dolomites. Uh, so the marmalada, you know, half is in and half is out. Um, so this is, this is a challenge in terms of developing the argumentation for, for the World Heritage Sites. But I, 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 and I, I think another quite challenge, so in, in the Swiss Alps, for instance, were this to be re-promoted as a mixed site, is the agricultural, the cultural landscape around the edges of the Swiss uh, Alps World Heritage Site, is that so different from the agriculture of other parts of the European mountains? I don't know. Again, I'm not enough of an expert to say so. So, I guess it was more of a passing comment. Um, I can't tell you what UNESCO is thinking because I am not that heavily involved in that bit of UNESCO. Um, but I, I still think it is an interesting question. And in fact, I mean, in my own part of Europe, in Scotland, we do have a, a very, we have a unique land use, which is a heather burning uh, to create a particular landscape for hunting of birds and, well, of birds, of a particular species of bird. And so we do have a unique landscape. In Scotland, then, the, there's been discussion that the Cairngorms could be proposed as a cultural landscape, uh, as a natural world heritage site. My argument, that's not very interesting. It's not universally different from, for instance, a lot of Norway. But this cultural landscape is different because it doesn't exist anywhere else. The Lake District in, uh, in England actually is being proposed as a cultural landscape World Heritage Site. So I think that the question in if a country, if a state wants to propose World Heritage Sites, it has to not, it has to look a long way beyond its own boundaries. It has to look to the global scale and to think really what is unique about something, about a cultural landscape that is really <coughs> different at its own regional scale, but is also globally very special. So I think there, there may be places to, to do this. Um, and I am, I, again, I don't know enough about it. I, I mentioned the two examples in the UK because I happen to know about them. So I, I think, yes, in, in, in Switzerland, you have vineyards that are a World Heritage Site, um, but they are relatively restricted. Um, and I'm not quite sure why those vineyards got to be on the list when there are an awful lot of other mountain vineyards in, in Europe, and I haven't read those designation documents, but obviously the argument was strong enough. Um, but um, it, is, it is a very interesting challenge as to see what is going on the World Heritage List uh, and what gets through or not. It is also, I would say, a very, very political process. I just, my turn is turn. I just uh, want to add, yes, uh, in Switzerland there are uh, cultural heritage sites like uh, the Laro uh, you mentioned. And uh, I think uh, it uh, depends from the perception of mountains uh, and uh, the, the, the task, uh, the function which is attributed to mountains uh, by people living outside. Um, and also those people who are occupying with mountains. <clears throat> when uh, we go to the conferences uh, to the Alps, uh, the, the cultural and economic side is <clears throat> uh, included. Uh, so in the Alps, we have uh, cultural heritage. Uh, in the Carpathians, uh, if you go to the uh, Carpathian Convention to a conference, you have uh, only forestry and agriculture, and again forestry and again agriculture, biodiversity in all landscape aesthetics, uh, this is dominating. And uh, this is a little bit uh, uh, due to the perception which uh, has, has been brought uh, from outside uh, to the mountains, and which is uh, a strategy uh, of uh, mountain uh, regions, uh, its uh, stakeholders, uh, to valorize uh, these places. Uh, as the macro-regional uh, work is in progress in the Alps, uh, we need more and more data analysis and uh, comparative maps, uh, as you should, uh, on the, the Alps. Uh, 
and uh, can we get more uh, more of these elements from Espel? Uh, is it uh, planned? Uh, because uh, even to 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 show uh, the diversity, we need more data and uh, maps, uh, especially in the e hubs. Yeah. Okay. Well, those those questions and comments were, were quite different. Um, I, I guess the comment I would make to Manfred in relation to the Carpathians versus the Alps is that political changes uh, have really influenced the types of research that have happened in the Alps compared to, uh, to, to the Carpathians. Uh, for a long time in the, the socialist communist era, being an anthropologist or a sociologist was not very uh, common. Uh, it wasn't something that, uh, that many people did. Um, whereas, of course, in the Alps, it has been an ongoing tradition. So I think the, because of that, there are relatively few uh, people who can talk about the more sort of human people aspects of the Carpathians than, for instance, here in, the, in, in Grenoble and, and many other institutions across the Alps. Um, so, but, but yes, I think it, it is also a question of who, who are the driving forces? How well are people integrated into these projects? And I would argue maybe that is another opportunity for Horizon 2020 to, to look at how to bring in the social scientists much more into, into the future uh, research programs, which of course have to generally be European level. Um, in relation to the question about future ESPON studies, I hope so. Um, I think in fact there should be proposals for future ESPON studies, but my main contact in this business uh, hasn't got hold of me recently and told me the latest status. But I believe there is a good chance there will be a new ESPON study in the next two or three years, uh, which will uh, be, be focusing on the mountains. Um, the problem is though, of course, if they are focusing on the mountains, how far outside the mountains will <coughs> they focus? And how will that relate to the macro-regional strategies? Um, so that's an interesting uh, paradox, in a way. Um, but the person to talk, do you know Eric Glerson? Uh, he is the man to ask that question to. Um, and uh, I, I would recommend, he, he has been, he and I basically have been behind most of these studies in the last few years, uh, coming from different perspectives, but we, we work very well together. So.